My name is Andre Spicer. I'm uh, the Dean of Bayes, uh, recently appointed. Uh, Bayes Business School has been at the forefront of business education for more than half a century. We've been developing leaders, helping businesses to thrive through both uncertainty and change. It is also a home to rigorous and cutting edge research, um, academic research, as we'll probably find out tomorrow has been pretty good, uh, as you'll, you'll see tomorrow from the ref results. Uh, and it's underpinned by some renowned research centres, one of those being the Centre for Banking Research, which is hosting this event tonight. It gives me great pleasure this evening to invite you all here and to those of you watching us online to the Henry uh, Thornton 2020 lecture. We're honoured to be joined by Professor Atif Mian, Professor of Economics, Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. Uh, before introducing Professor Mian, I would um, like to say a few words about the lecture. The Henry Thornton lecture was set up in um, 1979 in recognition of the 19th century economist and banker. Renowned for his insights into the British monetary system during the Napoleonic era, Henry Thornton is best known for his 1802 book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Effects of Paper Credit of, the Paper Credit of Great Britain. Historically, uh, the lectures focused on monetary theory and monetary policy, but latterly uh, it took a change of direction towards the area of finance. It is delivered by leading academic experts in the field from across the world. After the, chal the challenges of the pandemic, uh, which is posed to live events, it's wonderful to bring the Henry Thornton Lecture Series back here to Bayes in person and to see all of your lovely faces in front of me. I'd like to now invite uh, Professor Barbara Kazu, who's the Director of the Centre for Banking Research, to introduce this evening's speaker. Thank you, Barbara. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Henry Thornton Lecture 2022. This evening's lecture will be delivered by Professor Atif Mio, um, Professor of Economics, Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. Professor Mian began his career uh, by completing a bachelor degree in mathematics with computer science uh, and a PhD in economics from MIT. He has since taught at the University of California, Berkeley, at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. He is the director of the Yulis Rabinovich Center for Public Policy and Finance uh, at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. He also co-founded the Center for Economic Research in Pakistan a non-profit research institute dedicated to economic research, teaching, and innovation. Professor Mian's current research focuses on the deeper implication of rising inequality for the macroeconomy, including growth, financial markets, monetary policy, and fiscal policy. This evening, he will present his views on inequality and central banks, based on his co-author paper titled Indebted Demand, written with Ludwig Straub and Amir Sufi. Following his talk, Professor Mian will take part in a question and answer session with my colleague Vasu Ioannidou, Professor of Finance here at BASE. This latter part of the evening will be held under Chatham House rules, so please do not directly attribute any quotes from either Professor Mian or from Professor Ioannidou. After the event, I hope you will join us for networking and drinks outside. Now, all is left for me to do is to welcome Professor Mian to deliver the 2022 Henry Thornton Lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for, uh, for coming here. It's a pleasure to be here at Bayes um, and, and then give this uh, uh, Henry Thornton lecture. You can see from the title of the talk that was posted that I'm going to talk about inequality and how that connects with the decisions that we see central banks um, around the world making, especially in the developed rich countries. Um, I've been studying inequality and its effects on the macroeconomy um, uh, more seriously, I would say, over the last three to four years. And one thing that I've realized um, over this time is that in order to study something like inequality, uh, you have to do things 
differently than perhaps we are used to doing in studying other economic phenomena. So let me give you an example of like oil price uh, as an analogy. Um, we all know that rapid increase in oil price can have a serious, uh, mostly negative effect on the macro economy. Uh, think of the 70s, the sort of the big oil shock, or more recently what we are observing in the world today. Um, in a way, these shocks are easier to analyze because you're seeing large sudden changes and sudden responses to those sudden changes. And so you have a lot of variation, you have, um, uh, you, you sort of, you can observe the outcome in real time, so to speak, um, as our own lives are evolving. But when it comes to studying something like inequality, um, your, the way you analyze that problem needs to be a bit different. And the reason for that is that something like inequality does not change rapidly over a very short period of time, but it's the result of a gradual but very persistent uh, process that continues for year on year and decades on decades. And we want to think about that slow moving but persistent process and we want to understand the cumulative consequences of this, you know, it's like the slow moving but very big train that's moving. That's how you want to think about it. And what are the implications of this slow moving but persistent process on the broader macro economy? So you learn to be more patient uh, when you analyze uh, 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 data. And it's, 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 it's a more difficult question by its very nature because it's, as I said, it's a slow moving gradual process that you are trying to understand that accumulates over years and decades. So that's sort of the first um, point I want to, to make. Um, now, having said that, how should one think about inequality in the broader context of the macroeconomy? And the uh, sort of a broader observation that I want to make is that when you're thinking of such slow moving forces like inequality uh, over long periods of time, you have to analyze it in the context of the economy which essentially serves as an ecosystem of sorts. So just like you would study, a biologist might study a biological system or a physicist might study the, the planetary system and so on, just like that, when we study the deeper implications of uh, inequality on the macroeconomy, we have to keep in mind that the economy more broadly has a system of equations that must balance out um, at every point in time, so to speak. We, in economics lingo, we call that supply must equal demand at various points in time. And so the question is, as an economy is becoming more and more unequal, which has certainly been the case uh, in UK, US, and other advanced economies, and in fact, globally, just to put that in perspective, if you measure inequality by the share going to the very top 1% or even higher uh, as a share of the broader economy, we know that that measure of inequality has almost doubled since the 1980s. So that's, a, that's, that's an incredible rise in inequality. And if you were to ask the same question for wealth, the share of wealth owned by the top 1%, the rise in inequality would be even more extreme by that measure. So when we are talking about the rise uh, in inequality of that sort and its, and its impact on the broader macro economy, uh, the, way you want to understand uh, that question is in terms of its impact on the balance of this ecosystem. And the main thing that comes out, and I'll try to explain how that happens and why that happens, but the, uh, in a way I want to give you the broader punchline up front, which is the rise in inequality and certainly extreme inequality of the sort that I just talked about, which is the share of income going to the very small sliver of the population, 1% or even finer. A rise in inequality of that extreme nature, it tends to create an imbalance in that ecosystem that we are talking about. And just like the natural phenomena um, in, 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 in biological systems or planetary systems, we know from studying those systems that uh, a move towards imbalance, so think of these forces like homeostasis, which basically you know, regulate temperature and so on. If you start changing the underlying sort of um, process of heat creation in such a system, those kind of the natural equilibrium forces will become unstable. And those entire ecosystems are in danger of getting destroyed as a result of those more fundamental imbalances. So something like that starts to happen in a macroeconomy when 
inequality starts to rise um, and, it's, and it starts to kind of uh, go beyond uh, quote unquote acceptable levels. Now when I say acceptable, I'm not trying to make an ethical or moral statement here. So this is sort of one maybe sort of uh, important thing to highlight that one can always talk about inequality from a moral and ethical perspective and one should of course. But I'm, I want to f talk about it from just from a pure macroeconomic system perspective. Mm -hmm. And the point I want to make here uh, by the end of my talk is that that's where inequality actually tends to destabilize the system at the macro level. Okay? So it's not going to be a moral argument. It's not going to be a political argument. Uh, it's not going to be an ethical argument, even though it's perfectly uh, legitimate to be making those kind of arguments. But I'm going to be making an argument purely on the merits of the health of the uh, overall uh, economy and argue that the health of the overall economy is in collective danger because of the imbalances in the structure of the macroeconomy that, uh, that inequality creates. Okay? Um, and it's in that context that we need to think about what central banks have been doing and sort of the causes and consequences of, of their actions. Okay? So that's, that's sort of the the, the, the uh, direction of the talk, if you will. So let me now be a bit more specific and let me give you the broad trends of what has happened in uh, central banks around the major economies of the world over the last uh, 50, 60, 70 years. And uh, one way to look at that is to look at uh, what has happened to the main variable that they control, which is typically the short end of the yield curve, the, 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 the short end of, uh, the, 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 uh, of interest rate. Um, and what you see over here is this is the nominal interest rate that it sort of, while it rose in the 70s, that was partly because inflation itself was rising. So if you were to look at interest rates in real terms, which is to say subtract inflation, the picture would be flatter more muted over the post-World War years, because a lot of this upward movement is actually reflecting upward movement in inflation. What is more interesting is, because inflation then starts to die down and becomes quite stable during the 90s, 2000s, the last 30, 40 years. What is interesting is that that period, like the post-1980 period more generally, um, the pointer is not working, but the post-1980 period more generally, the real short-term rate, because again, inflation is more constant over that time period, the real short-term rate has actually constantly been going down. It's almost as if there is uh, there's some persistent long-run, long-term force behind it that's pushing it down constantly. And that's, that's sort of the hint I want to give you is that it's there, 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 that there is a force behind, as I'll try to argue, that's actually making these interest rates go lower and lower. It's an attempt to keep the balance in this macroeconomy. That's basically what's happening, and I'll, again, explain in more detail how and why that is happening. But that's the first observation I want you to just keep in mind, and it's happening across the board. You know, I'm showing you the main economies, the Euro area, Japan, UK, and the US, that between them they cover uh, a large chunk of the global economy, and you can see all across the board it's not like one is going up and the other one is going there. All being pushed in the same direction. Um, so there's something behind that's making things look like that. Now what has happened, if now I'm zooming in on the more recent year, the last 20 years, that in fact you can already see it, so it happens in Japan first. Um, you start hitting what's called the zero lower bound. You know, you, you start, you know, there's, you can't make nominal interest rates below zero in the modern uh, financial system or monetary system, and so, um, they, they, they want to keep interest rates lower for longer. And in an attempt to do that, they start doing something else that they had never done before, by and large, which is um, over the last, especially since the 2008 financial crisis, they start doing what is referred to as quantitative easing, which is to expand the, on the quantity margin, right? Interest rate is the price margin that the central bank controls. But then on the quantity margin, they started increasing the size of the balance sheet of central banks by buying up assets, typically treasuries, government bonds, and securities. And they have just been doing more and more of that. 
And again, some places like Japan have done it even more than others. But what is common is that all major economies have uh, attempted to, as I'll argue, balance the economy by taking action on the quantitative margin as well and, 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 and purchasing longer dated um, um, assets. Okay, so again, that's another uh, sort of a reference data point to keep in mind. Um, the, so again, this is broadly central banks easing more and more. That's the broad theme that comes out of the last two slides that I showed you. Central banks have been easing more and more for a long period of time. From 1980s onwards, they've been easing and easing and easing on the interest rate margin and then on the quantitative easing margin. Um, so keep that fact as fact number one in your, in your head. What country is it? So this is uh, US. So the second fact that I want to show you is, but it's actually not just the US. If I were to show this graph, uh, you'll see a similar picture for uh, other advanced economies as well. The second fact is the following. There has been an incredible rise in debt globally. So first of all, that statement is true no matter where you look at it, no matter how you look at it. And in particular, I'm going to keep talking about 1980 as this point of inflection throughout. Because these series, they all tend to turn around, something tends to happen around 1980, and I'm going to come to that in a, in a few minutes. Um, but you start to see the, a rise in total debt or credit as a share of the global economy around that time period. And just to illustrate that point, I'm showing you this graph for the US. But as I said, this is representative of what is happening more broadly, uh, globally. Now, the other point that this picture is showing is that when you look at the rise in total credits, first of all, in terms of magnitude, it's um, doubling or more. So for the same dollar of output, the global economy is, is, has you know, more than twice the amount of debt that it used to have. Now, the other point of emphasis here, and this is why I've split total debt for the US into two broad categories. One is corporate debt that corporations issue. That has risen, but not as much as you can see. The bulk of the rise in credit, and again, this is a fact not just for the US, but it's true of China, it's true of Europe, it's true of Japan, and so on. The bulk of the rise in credit is focused, is concentrated in household on the private side and then governments, okay? Um, another way of thinking about this separation is that you can broadly, loosely think of corporate debt as financing the supply side of the economy, right? They're trying to invest to build a factory or something like that. We haven't seen that much increase in that kind of financing, stuff that finances the supply side of the economy. Primarily, this debt has been used to finance the demand side of the economy, because that's where households borrow to consume more privately, or governments borrow to spend, which is called government consumption, right? So that's the second fact that I want you to keep in mind, that this growth in debt has, has been incredible. It starts in 1980, and most of it is to finance demand of the economy as opposed to, to finance investment or the supply side of the economy, okay? Um, and again, just like the central bank uh, 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 prices and quantities, there seems to be some persistent force that continues to push debt in just one direction, continues to go up. In fact, that direction is very interesting because if you, you know, I'm not separating household and government debt here, but if you were, what you'll see is that until 2008, it was the private household credit that was rising very rapidly. And then it slows down, and in fact stops, because of the financial crisis, but something else happens, which is the government debt starts growing. It's the governments that start running much larger deficits. And what I'm going to argue is that it is not a coincidence that when one stops, the other starts to rise. It has to rise. That's, I'm going to be making that point. And to understand why government debt has to fill what is now left as a whole because private credit is not rising, it has to do that. Otherwise, governments would be faced with deeper recessions and a lot more political resentment that they obviously don't want. 
But behind all of this is a deeper force in the economy that's pushing all of these series. And I'm going to argue that that deeper force is inequality. And it's pushing all of us. It's pushing the global economy and it's pushing all of us as a result of that um, into a deeper hole of sorts that we are finding it harder and harder to get out of. And I'm going to explain that in more detail in a few minutes. Okay. Um, so now that you've seen those two facts, I want you to ponder over this quote of one of your central bank governors, right? Mark Carney, who was the governor from 2013 until 20, 2020. Look at the quote, and there's, we want to understand what this quote means. And by the way, he's not the only one. You know, some major other central bank governors have made similar statements. But he says the sustainability of debt burdens depends on interest rates remaining low. Those are the two series I showed you. More and more debt and lower and lower interest rates. And in a sense, his quote is connecting those two. Given the high levels of debt, how can interest rate ever be high? Because if it were to go higher in real terms, the debts will become unsustainable. That's basically what he's trying to say. So he's saying, maybe not as explicitly, but in a way he's saying, what do you want me to do? With this level of debt, how can I ever raise rates? Right? But there is a flip side of this as well, which is interest rates have gone lower and lower in order to create more and more debt. That is also true. And the deeper truth here is not that debt are high and hence interest rate has to be low or vice versa. The deeper truth here is that there is a common force that's driving both in the direction that we see them going. And that deeper force is inequality. And in particular, the rise in inequality. Okay? So that's, that's the point that I now want to make next. Like, what's, let's study this ecosystem now. And what we are going to see is that when you build a system of sorts and you discipline that system by how people actually tend to behave in, in ways that I'll specify in a minute, uh, it naturally leads to these outcomes as you raise inequality in a way that we have seen uh, in the modern context. Okay? All right. So here's the basic argument. Let me just put out the full argument, and then I'll go through its explanation bit by bit. What's the connection? The connection basically is, you know, it's like, what's the difference between the very rich and the rest of us? Just one difference, right? They have more money. There's no other fundamental difference between them and us. What I mean to say is that there is something about human nature that when you become very rich, you tend to have systematically a particular kind of behavior. And it is that behavior that slowly is accumulating and creating these kind of patterns that I just showed you. So what is that behavior? And we know this behavior very well, by the way, from behavioral literature, when people do studies of human consumption saving decisions and so on. It's very straightforward, actually. Philosophers earlier and economists earlier, you can go back and talk about Hobson and Keynes and others, they've all talked about this. But in a way, we forgot to incorporate that basic feature when we talk about the macroeconomy, when we talk about monetary policy, when we talk about fiscal policy and taxation policy in particular. And that's something I'm going to bring, bring back at the very end. Um, what is that fact? That fact is that the very rich, they tend to save at a significantly higher fraction than the rest of the population. And it's particular what, you know, in technical terms, we'll say saving out of permanent income. So if I make a person richer by a million dollars over their lifetime, a typical person might save a very small fraction of it. Why? Because they will say, OK, I've had nothing. Now I have a million. But over my lifetime, I'm going to spend all of it. I'm going to eat more. I'm going to travel more. I'm going to you know, buy more clothes, so on and so forth. But if you're already a billionaire, and I give you, I increase your permanent income, your lifetime income, by another million dollars. What is he or she going to do? They already, you know, more than likely they're going to be satiated on the regular stuff that we consume and demand. So they will perhaps go for accumulating more assets. Maybe they exercise some power as a result of it, you know. 
because uh, they control more employees and things like that. Uh, but whatever the, the reason might be, all we care about from studying the system's perspective, and again, I'm not making any value judgment here, as I've already said, I'm not here to make any political statements. As a matter of descriptive behavior, that's what happens. They tend to save a lot more um, when you give them an extra million dollar as over their lifetime. A natural consequence of that is that now imagine that as a system, this class, the very rich, roughly think of that as the top 1%, but even finer. Um, if they start getting a higher fraction of the income of overall GDP, GDP is the total income of the economy, as they start getting a higher share, and I've already said that share has almost doubled since 1980, um, what is going to happen naturally is that this economy as a whole will tend to consume less and try to save more. But guess what? It's never possible for the economy as a whole to save more without consequences. So the system starts to respond to that tendency of ever rising total saving as a result of rising inequality. And how does the system respond? It will respond by trying to create, because when at the very top they're trying to save more, the system responds by trying to create alternative sources of demand or consumption, because consumption will start to fall. And how does the system, this ecosystem, which you call the economy, responds? Well, it responds by trying to convince someone to borrow and spend that money that the very rich want to save. They'll say, OK, fine, you can save. How do you save? You save through the financial system. And then the financial system will take that money, will try to lend it to someone else and convince them to spend. And so we start to see something happen around 1980s, actually. It's very interesting you start to see the banking sector start lobbying and marketing, home equity lines of credit, credit cards. We had not seen these things in kind of this retail space as much before, but we start seeing it. Why? Because financial institutions all of a sudden have these surpluses that they're trying to loan out to the society. And they start lobbying for the GSEs and uh, government entities to make it easier for people to borrow and spend. And for a while, it all works perfectly. The very rich are able to save more, and the rest are able to borrow and spend, so they feel happier. Except, and that's where the concept of indebted demand comes in, that there is a problem. Because the rise in consumption, it's not really a rise. It's you're compensating for the lost consumption. So actually, in the aggregate, things are just going as they were. But there is this shift happening in between where this relative rise in consumption is driven by debt financing. It's that concept is what we call indebted demand. Why? Because while when you borrow and spend, it gives a short-term stimulus to the economy, the next year when you have to pay back the loan, the same stimulus now acts as a drag on the economy. Because now you have to return with interest what you had borrowed in the period before. But here's the thing about the ecosystem. That's where you have to balance things out. It's not possible. As a collective, it's not possible for the, let's just call them the non-rich. Collectively for them, it's not possible to pay back to the very rich. Why is it not possible? Because if they were to do that, remember, the top 1% will again try to save most of what they are getting back. And the economy will again be short of demand. So the problem that you solved the previous period by issuing more debt, you will have that problem again, and even worse. Because now you have received back from the non-rich, not just the previous amount, but plus interest as well. So something must give for this economy to remain in balance. And that is the interest rate must fall further to make this indebted demand sustainable for a while longer. And that's the process that continues then in a world of rising and high inequality is that you have this constantly rising uh, debt financed consumption with falling interest rates. The two have to go in that direction. Otherwise, as Mark Carney said, what else do you expect? Right? The only way you can sustain higher and higher 
debt finance consumption is for the interest rate to be lower and lower. That's the idea behind indebted demand. Except, I sometimes say this is no way to live collectively because you cannot push on this margin forever. Interest rates cannot keep going down forever. There's a natural limit in, like I said, the zero limit, if nothing else. But there are other problems with zero limit as well. And if you have time, I'll get into that. But let's for now imagine that zero limit um, is there and you can't go below that. What happens then? Well, when you st as you start approaching that limit, this ecosystem, that's where it starts to break down. And this imbalance that you were trying to prevent becomes less and less preventable. And this is this idea that we refer to as the debt trap. You can get trapped into a world of very high levels of debt, interest rates now stuck at zero, and now ultimately growth will start to shrink. And you will start to have more problems than you had before. Okay. What time do I end, by the way? Sounds good. So I want to give you a flavor of, you know, I said we, what, we, what we try and do as economists is we try to study these systems. And I've already given you the intuition of what comes out when you study the system. But I also want to give you a little bit of a flavor of how do you build these systems. And the way you do that is, again, you have to appeal to sort of mathematical models of the economy because you want to impose some discipline like supply must equal demand and everything must add up and things of that. So this stuff becomes compli complicated quite quickly when you start putting this system together and so that as usual you have to appeal to language of mathematics to kind of make sure you keep everything on track. And so this is an illustration of how you would put in place in this system one of those core truths of human behavior, which is what I started with, which is that as you become richer, you tend to save more. So what you will then do is, when you are designing the system, you'll say, well, everyone has a utility function. They care about consumption. That's C here. That's the typical way people formulate utility functions for individuals. Say log consumption, something like that. You care about consumption. But you say, OK, there's one thing we want to add, which is this term in, 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 in red, V of A, that in, when they become richer, they not only care about consumption, but they start caring about accumulating assets for their own sake. So wealth directly starts to enter the utility function in a way that it would not for ordinary middle class individuals, because as I said, they just want to first uh, eat well and clothe themselves well and so on. And that's the only little change you add to the system. And what's remarkable is that everything else follows. Other than that, it's just the usual run-of-the-mill economic system. But you just make one alteration to human behavior, which is backed by data and scientific evidence. And you, and you see something quite remarkable, which is what I just described to you, which is this idea of indebted demand. So let me just now show you graphically you can represent this system. So what does this system look like graphically? I'll skip this. This is more of a technical point. Graphically, the indebted demand system looks as follows. Over the long run, you have borrowers, which is to say that you convince someone to borrow more, the lower interest rate, so this is the interest rate on the y-axis, and the amount of debt for borrowers or credit for savers, how much you save, which will be credited to someone else. I'm going to come to that in a minute. But this credit demand curve is downward sloping quite naturally, because if you want the borrowers to borrow more, you'll have to reduce the interest rate because then the debt service burden is lower, right? So quite intuitive, quite natural. What is a little bit out of the usual intuition is that in fact, even for the savers, their supply of credit is also downward sloping. And this is the key thing that changes once you introduce this love for wealth in the utility function. So, why does that happen? Well, the reason is that the richer, so now debt is like credit for the savers. The richer they get, the more they want to save. And so the lower, that love of saving actually means that they are willing to hold 
debt, which on their balance sheet is an asset, right? Remember that. They're willing to hold debt at a lower and lower expected return because they just don't know what else to do with it. That's the idea. So they're willing to hold it at lower and lower interest rates. And that's why that uh, credit supply curve also slopes downward. And the economy, the balance of the economy, right? that balancing act is represented by where these two lines intersect. That's the green dot here. Now what happens, the next thing I want to show in this experiment is, so this is where we are. We are this, this system right now is in balance. This ecosystem of sorts is in balance at the green dot. Let's do our main experiment now, which is a rise in inequality, right? What happens, so for those of you who have done supply and demand, this is supply and demand, right? This, one of the supply and demand curves is going to shift as a result of rising inequality. And in, in particular, it's going to be the behavior of the very rich that's going to shift. And it's going to shift leftwards as a result of rising inequality. Why? The basic intuition for that is that for the, because the very rich have more money now, they want to save even more. Because remember, they, saving is kind of a luxury good here. And so now for the same amount of credit that we had before, so think of this vertical line below red, uh, the green dot, they want to now are even willing to accept a lower expected return to hold the same amount of debt. So the, that's why this shift is to the left and down. And the red dot represents the new equilibrium of this economy, which is a more unequal macroeconomy. This more unequal macroeconomy, now notice, is giving us exactly what we saw in those initial patterns uh, for the global economy, which is lower interest rate and higher amount of debt in equilibrium. It's exactly that indebted demand force that's working in the background. There is as a result of this rising inequality, less overall demand to boost that demand back to where it was, we are forced to lower interest rate and forced to increase the amount of debt in the economy, which is on the, on the x-axis. All right, is this true? Or is this just a flight of fancy, this modeling and theoretical um, ideals? We can put it to data. I showed you the rise in credit, which is the orange line here. And you can see it correlates quite closely to the rise in inequality. And the falling interest rates happens around the same time as well. So these things line up actually quite well in the time series. In fact, you can also do another experiment. So this is yet another empirical experiment to verify these ideas, if you will, which is to think of the 50 states in the United States as individual countries or islands, if you will. And what we know is that while there has been this overall rise in inequality, not all states have become more unequal in the same way. Some have become more unequal than others. They've all become more unequal, but some more than others. One prediction of this idea that if you become more unequal, the very rich in, in your island will want to save more is that your overall accumulated wealth as a share of your income will rise. Because remember, they want to save more. So the more unequal the state becomes, the larger will be the total accumulation of wealth in that state, financial wealth. And that's exactly what you find when you look across US states. And on the x-axis, uh, 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 I have variation in rise in inequality. And states, you can see they almost perfectly line up actually, nothing else I'm doing to the data. But states that become more unequal, they see a larger rise in total wealth as a share of, as a fraction of total income that they generate, that, that state generates. Okay? And it's all being driven by the, the top end of the income distribution, not by the rest of the economy. Right? So it's exactly the set of people that we suspected are driving this aggregate increase in wealth. All right. So let's now, now that we have understood the, the system and sort of the how this slow moving but persistent force of rising inequality that I talked about, how that uh, 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 manifests itself into rising credit and lower interest rate. Let's think about policy implications. So let's think of monetary policy now. And now you can start to understand and perhaps appreciate the predicament that Mark Carney finds himself in, which is that when this deeper force is pushing the economy in one direction, 
We sometimes refer to this interest rate as R star, the equilibrium interest rate, this red dot or green dot interest rate. If that is because of rising inequality continuously being pushed downwards, monetary policy will be forced to respond. Because if they don't, there will be a recession, and then they will be forced to respond. And so as a result of these forces, monetary policy is uh, forced to be more and more accommodative. Now, at times, they might try to be even more accommodative because for whatever reason, perhaps political or otherwise, they want to juice up the economy even more. But guess what? When they do that, they are going to be successful in the short run, but only by creating yet more debt, which, for reasons I've already argued, the reasons of indebted demand will push further downward pressure on interest rates next period and so on. In a way, central bankers have, in this world where your tool of interest rate is actually not working directly through interest rates, but is directly through their effect on credit creation, which is, which is basically what you see empirically when you look closely how monetary policy, the, the channel, how that works, a lot of it is through the credit channel. When that happens, you are going to have this idea of limited ammunition. You can create more demand today, but now you have burned those bullets, shot those bullets. So you have now limited bullets left in your arsenal to do the same thing again. Because that debt that you have created today will now sit on the balance sheets of individuals, and the tomorrow's interest rate will have to be lower to keep servicing that, that existing debt, exactly as Mark Carney's statement was, uh, was suggesting. And ultimately, you can't keep on doing this forever, because debt, cannot, debt to GDP cannot go to infinity, or interest rates cannot go below zero. And so that's when this economy becomes trapped in uh, what we refer to as a debt trap. OK, so what, how do you get out of this? It's quite clear that we are kind of around that margin. Now, conceptually, you can run this a while longer. Once you s the private sector stops borrowing, then the government comes in. And governments can borrow more, because they have the taxation power and so on, and they can borrow at a lower rate. So you can keep this going longer, but then the government sector will just keep becoming more and more bloated in a way. In the, in the sense of debt to GDP, government debt to GDP. Um, ultimately, that is not a way to run modern economies over, over the very long run. So something else must change. And this is the point I want to end with, that given this persistent imbalance, structural imbalance, I should say, driven by extreme inequality, the kind of forces that we need to br bring stability back to the system you can actually study the same system, and you can ask yourself, what kind of policies? And we do that in the paper, by the way, so it's formally it's all done. But let me give you the quick kind of focus on sort of the second half of the slide, and then I'll close. The set of policies that come out as solutions to this structural problem, the obvious one is you want to reduce inequality by making the growth system more equitable. And we can get into how you do that. But let's say you cannot do it. What else can you do? Well, taxation needs to be more progressive. But not just any kind of taxation. So for example, you know, value-added tax is very common and even popular among certain circles. It actually is quite bad in terms of solving the problem that is there. The kind of taxation that actually works best is not even income taxation, which is still works if it's progressive enough. But really, the kind of taxation that goes to the heart of the problem, if you will, is wealth taxes, actually. So you know, think of some wealth tax above a certain threshold um, that mid middle class uh, needs just to own a house and so on. Um, that kind of taxation actually solves this problem right away, uh, conceptually. And what starts to happen, one way to see that you're solving the problem is that the economy will try to rebalance more naturally, which is to say this interest rates will not be stuck down to zero. And they'll start rising, but naturally, without creating debt, uh, without making debt unsustainable, because demand will rise not because of debt, but because through wealth tax, the income is more equally distributed now. Um, that's the idea. 
And there are related issues of competition and so on in the markets that we need to um, promote as well. Again, the broader notion is anything that makes the growth process more equitable is good for everyone in the economy. Notice the other thing, I'm not asking, the wealth taxes here are not for revenue raising. So the taxation, the system of taxation is typically people think of it, you want to raise taxes to raise revenue. That's not the motive here. In fact, you can cut down income taxes and raise wealth tax in a way that the whole thing is revenue neutral. And still the economy will benefit a lot because you're rebalancing, the whole issue is you're rebalancing the economy uh, by removing this tilt that it has right now of having too little demand because most of the income is sitting in the hands of those who tend to save too much. Right? That's the problem that you're trying to solve. So let me um, um, close here. Again, I tried to give a sense of why the deeper force that's moving all of these variables and forcing the hand of central bankers in particular um, is actually inequality and what its implications are in terms of how to actually solve this problem um, going forward. Um, I look forward to the conversation, but thank you so much for your patience.